Hello, welcome to The Conversation on New Central Television. This is the program where we bring you all the latest political stories happening on the African continent. I am Benga Aborowa. And I'm Rita Omodia. Today on The Conversation, we'll discuss the fresh challenges faced by the UK-Rwanda asylum deal as the first flight scheduled to take refugees was cancelled. In another development, Malawi's president cancels trips as part of the government's austerity measures. Benga, these are two very interesting topics. I uh, mean, a lot of people were actually looking forward to the Rwanda asylum deal, but unfortunately we didn't see any flight. And even... Now, for, it depends on what side of the divide you fall. You said unfortunately. Okay. So okay. A lot of people <laughs> will say fortunately, because it's so. a very contentious issue. Mm -hmm. And on the second story uh, about... President um, Lazarus Chakwera, Chakwera yeah. of Malawi. I did see a Nigerian uh, newspaper, and they, they had to bring in the Nigerian president. They said, unlike Nigeria's junketing president, I, I, Malawi's I, I know, president. I, I know that, yes, Nigeria's president has actually been guilty of these offenses of going for medical trips, but it's not just Nigeria. I think some other African countries' presidents are also guilty yes. of this, uh, going so, for medical so trips if abroad. If you're going to force the people to take austere measures in order to react to the economic realities. The, you have to lead from the top. So kudos to President Lazarus Tequera. Definitely a kudos to him. And right now we begin with the update on the UK-Rwanda asylum deal. Now the first flight to take asylum seekers to Rwanda has not taken off as scheduled. This is because the European Human Rights Court issued last-minute injunctions to stop the deportation of the handful of people on board. The UK government's plan to send asylum seekers to Rwanda on Tuesday had been heavily criticized by opponents, charities and religious leaders who said the deportations were inhumane and the government was forced to fight a series of legal challenges in London courts aimed at stopping the flight departing. A handful of asylum seekers were scheduled to fly from an Air Force base in southwest England. But shortly before the plane was due to leave on Tuesday, the European Court of Human Rights granted injunctions to prevent the deportations. The Home Secretary said the government would not be deterred in its deportation plans and would prepare for the next flight. Now, joining me live from Kigali, the Rwandan capital, is Bukire Pacifique, a research and political analyst. I also have joined in from Washington, D.C. in the United States, Calvin Duck, a global affairs analyst. One welcome to you, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us on the conversation. Thank you. Good to be here. Now I'd like to start with Calvin. Calvin, what do you make of the latest decision by the European uh, Court for Human Rights issuing an injunction to stop the deportations to Rwanda? Well, first of all, um, being someone who lives and is from a country with our own immigration gimmicks under some administrations, I was very pleased at the decision that at least puts a pause on this program and canceling that first flight, mostly because even once you put the human rights issues aside, the legal issues aside, it's a very gimmicky policy. It's not a real solution. And so I think that I, I, I agree with the um, court's decision, and I hope that it sticks, because I don't think it's good or sound policy. I think it's basically a gimmick from the, um, Boris Johnson's government. Now, going in line with a lot of opposition about this Rwandan scheme, over to you now, uh, Bukiri. Now, if you look at this, the Rwandan scheme has faced a lot of opposition from all quarters. The UN refugee chief, Filippo Grandi, had earlier denounced the UK government policy as all wrong and said it should not be exporting its responsibility to another country. We also saw the Church of England leaders, for example, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, also criticizing the deportation plan. Now, why are so many people opposed to a scheme which has been touted as innov innovative by the government? I think they oppose the, this initiative um, based on some legal ground, uh, but I cannot just... Um, be very clear on the legal ground they're based on their uh, argument against this initiative. Um, but if you see, if you go into details, maybe we see uh, from one individual to another, among those asylum seekers that they want to deport in Rwanda, they, might, they may have their own reason against that initiative. But uh, as a simple citizen, 
uh, in Rwanda, I couldn't be against this initiative because as Rwanda, as people in Rwanda, we just look forward to receive other citizens who are about to be, I can say, to be rejected by some other state or who are not, or who are not, that they are not, they are not like, um, you don't have that opportunity to be accepted as a refugee in England. So for as Rwandan to receive those people, I don't see, I don't see any uh, problem or argument against it. Okay, but when you look at the geography, uh, Uganda, uh, Rwanda, I beg your pardon, is 8,000 kilometers away from the United yeah. Kingdom. Uh, Uganda, Rwanda does have its own internal problems. So wh why, what's in it for, you, for Rwanda? Uh, why would you want to, you know, receive something that is meant to be United Kingdom's problem? I guess what, what, what's what do uh, ordinary Rwand, Rwandans uh, think about this scheme, uh, Bukire? I can't say it's about our hospitality. If UK don't want to deal with those asylum seekers, if you don't don't want to give them the 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 asylum, and if Rwanda agrees to receive those uh, asylum seekers. Um, I see it as like kind of hospitality. Yeah, some people may say there is like some benefit, but I don't see like uh, a big benefit, like a part of being like humanity, that kind of humanity. I mean, yeah. if it's humanity, why is the Rwandan government collecting uh, uh, money up to $140 million for this scheme? It almost made most, a lot of people have criticized it as a cash for refugees a scheme and a form of human trafficking. I, I will not agree with those who say that it's about money because if it's about, if, okay, if they're coming to Rwanda, they have to live, they have to have accommodation, they have to like to have their daily expense. I think. That man is going to help them to live their life here. It's not like um, it's not like business. Like they are okay. investing to get some uh, some return on uh, on that business. It's just like money uh, to help those asylum seekers where why they will be here in in Rwanda. So that's what I understand in it. Okay, Calvin, I would like you to respond to this because Bukiri has said that's a form of his hospitality. It's not about money. Yeah. But Human Rights Watch issued a public letter warning that serious human rights abuses continue to occur in Rwanda. So the question is, why Rwanda? Point, and it's one of the things that for me has been um, probably the most difficult to kind of understand because it seems as if Boris Johnson's government is speaking out of both sides of its mouth. On the one hand, they're saying, you know, well, let's send, send these refugees who come here legally to Rwanda where they can apply for as asylum, hopefully have a better life there. But then on the other side of the mouth, they're saying to smugglers and people who would come to the UK, don't come here or we'll send you to Rwanda as if it's a punishment. And so, yes, there are um, human rights issues in Rwanda, but then Rwanda is not alone in that. I don't think that this this on behalf of the UK government does not uh, really address the problem. And I just really wanna say quickly on the issue of money. Um, one of the problems that I has, I mentioned that this isn't sound policy, is if the UK government really want, I mean, clearly they're willing to spend the money. If they really wanted to solve the problem, why not work with the countries where these refugees are coming from to figure out ways that they could change the push and pull factors? You know, or maybe use that money to then tackle the smugglers mm. and punish them, send them somewhere. Why are you going to target the refugees? So I think that's why it's an all wrong headed policy. And it sends such such a bad message to the refugees that would be rejected, while other refugees from Ukraine and other places would be welcomed with open arms in the UK. Uh, thank you, Calvin. I would like to bring in Bukiri here uh, and still following on the question of why rwanda a lot of people are 
shocked and amazed at the choice of Rwanda. Uh, you did earlier mention that uh, Rwanda is doing it because of its hospitable nature. Uh, the uh, yes, the foreign minister Vincent Biruta did actually say that you know Rwanda has a history of hosting refugees and it's a hospitable country. But last year, Britain called for investigations into extrajudicial killings, deaths in custody and torture in the country. This same Britain. And in 2018, Rwandan police shot at at least 12 refugees. It shot them dead as they protested outside the UNHCR office in Karungi district. So my question is, if Rwanda is such a hospitable country, uh, why do you send uh, why do you shoot protesting refugees if if they're so hospitable oh thank you but i'll i will not comment uh, like on that case particular case because i don't have like uh, full information particular case of the refugee that has been shot uh because I'm not in power of commenting on that, but um, what I know as normal citizen in Rwanda that we have that hospitality of uh, receiving refugees. We've been receiving uh, uh, so many refugees from different countries. I can say from even uh, from uh, Somalia have have been have been here before. Even refugees from the surrounding countries have been here before and. I've been enjoying life here. Some have been here in transition, and after all, they have been they have been going to settle in some countries in Europe. Um, is that all right now? But from case to case, I don't have like full information to comment on that. Um, yeah, that will be my intervention. Now, uh, let's talk about the refugees once they come. If this plan goes according to, if it scales through the courts and these uh, refugees are eventually transferred to Rwanda. Uh, what type of life awaits them? How would they integrate with the local population? And uh, would they be kept in camps? And how, how does the government plan to go about it? I won't speak, I, I, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the government. I just speak of what I have heard in the news as normal citizen here in Rwanda. They, they will be given like uh, accommodation where to stay they will be traveling as normal people in Rwanda, as me or other ones. They will not be kept like in like in cage or something. They have their freedom to travel. They have their their time for integration as other refugees who are already living here in Rwanda. Um, I think also they are lucky because they do not be living in camp. They will just be living in good accommodations, in nice place here in some of the nice places here in Kigari. Um, I have seen the accommodation where they will be living. It's nice accommodation. I think they will be well accommodated here in Rwanda if it happens that they come here in Rwanda. But I also know that there's still there's still river process going on in in England. So if 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 they don't come, it's, it's also the um, I can say we will have to respect that as normal season in Rwanda. Okay. But if also they come, we have to accommodate them as just like uh, as just like other season here, and they will have the opportunity to reintegrate in our society. All right, thank you. Now, Calvin, if we look at this now, the Conservative MPs are demanding that Boris Johnson withdraws from the European Court of Human Rights after the first Rwanda deportation flight was cancelled. Now, what exactly is the impact of this? Because a lot of people are seeing it as, as more of an embarrassment and a significant uh, a downstep for Boris Johnson. Well, you know, as we as we know, Boris Johnson has had a very tumultuous um, last couple of months. But after surviving the no confidence vote, I can see several things that um, he and his government have done that have kind of pushed the envelope. There's this there's a Northern Ireland protocol. that's also been something he's been dealing with. Um, I do think that um, what is interesting is he's going to receive pressure on, you know, following the European court's um, order. But of course, that will all depend on what happens with the UK court in July, because under extreme circumstances, countries can, you know, um, not respect a ruling, but that hasn't 
you know, been done by Britain in quite a while, if at all. So I think that what Boris Johnson's going to have to do is figure out how to save face, how to make this um, canceled flight, which if you saw the pictures, it was sad that he, there were, what, seven people, if that many, on this on this um, plane and the amount per person to even do this mm-hmm. was astronomical. Mm-hmm. So he's going to have to do something to save face with his party and with UK voters. But do you think Britain has a more responsibility to be uh, looking at its foreign policy and its history of invading countries? Yes, it's so um, just like if you look at its historical context, we now have, um, you know, the colonizer country now sending people back to Africa because sending some refugees back to Africa, let me just make that clear, um, and then not wanting to deal with them. It's just, you know, the height of the colonization mentality. But I think one of the things that, you know, that you just brought up is very important is in any country, you know, there are human rights violations. What happens if this program is restarted and refugees from the UK are sent to Rwanda if there are human rights violations there, or if there are um, not political rights given to them, or whatever may happen, if they if there's um, you know if they don't fit in in the society because maybe other refugees don't get the same kind of support that these refugees get, whose responsibility is it? Does the UK get to shuck off their responsibility because they paid a, paid a few million pounds, or do they share it with Rwanda, or they just turn a blind eye and don't care? So I think that's a really really important thing to consider. Thank you, Calvin. I'd like to bring in uh, Bukiri here. Now, um, away from the criticisms of this plan, uh, there might be some upside uh, to this uh, migrant arrangement uh, with the United Kingdom. What do ordinary migrants who have fled uh, worse conditions in their various countries to make it to the shores of England, what do they stand to gain if they do eventually make this trip uh, to Kigali? What are the upsides uh, for them, if there are any? Uh, can you repeat, please, my network was shaking. Yes. yes, I said uh, a lot of these uh, migrants that might be transported to Rwanda have fled a really gruesome conditions. A lot of them fled a political persecution, uh, farming, starvation, wars. And uh, I believe Rwanda uh, might offer uh, a lot, uh, a second chance in life for them. What are the upsides uh, for this uh, migrant if they eventually make it to Kigali? What do they stand to gain? Um, I would say, like, um, if we see Rwanda like uh, a secure country where normal people can start his his life. Um, I can't say, I don't see like any upset or any problem that they may face, um, like as asylum seekers here in Rwanda. If, if, I, if, I, go, if I get where your, your question is. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, what do they stand uh, yeah. to gain is what he's asking. Uh, okay, like... I won't go in, into details because I don't have like the details. Okay. Uh, but okay, okay. Right. Away, away, away from that, uh, just recently, a United Nations tribunal has yes. ruled that a Felicien Kabuga, who is alleged to be one of the main financiers of the 1994 genocide in Rwanda, is yes. fit to stand trial in the Hague, where he's currently detained. What's your take on this? Um. I think like uh, it's it's a rigorous process. He, he, he has to face like uh, he has to face uh, justice because even he at has his done, like, even at his old age, Rwanda. eighty-seven years. Even though he's eighty-seven years old, you feel justice should still be served. Yeah. If I get to your question, because my, sorry, my network is shaking somehow. Okay, you know what, let's hear from Calvin while we try to get your connection. Now, Calvin, you heard of the news of the United Nations uh, Court saying that uh, Felicien Kabuga is actually fit to stand trial. Now, this is a man who has been uh, wanted for about 25 years after the 1994 Rwandan genocide. Now, what's your take on this? 
do you think that justice would actually be said for a man who is about 87 years old? Well, for me, the, uh, the case doesn't really hinge on his age because here in the United States, we um, always say you have to face the music no matter how old you are. Um, I think that this is, it's a good thing because we will see what justice needs to be done. We will bring people to justice and we'll see, you know, and people can also be acquitted. It doesn't mean that this is necessarily a, you know, a definite condemnation, but I don't think age at all um, plays a role in this. Um, as long as you're here, you should still have to face justice and have your day in court to at least explain your side and have justice done. Mm. Now, Calvin, still looking at this uh, offshoring of refugees, uh, the Brit, the, the United Kingdom uh, did copy the Australian method of offshoring uh, refugees. Australia does uh, process its refugees in faraway islands of Manaus and Papua New Guinea. What are some of the consequences if this goes ahead, if the European Court for Human Rights uh, gives the United Kingdom the green light to process uh, refugees and offshore them in Rwanda. What are its implications for uh, refugees around the world? Let's uh, and having at the back of our mind that even uh, the UNHCR uh, president has condemned this, and a lot of people are actually against it. Well, I think that it would definitely hurt the plight of refugees all around the world, um, mostly because this send, this would send the message that countries that are more well off, that they don't have to deal with um, refugee human trafficking issues, that they can pay another country that may have their own more significant issues to deal with it. It'll also stigmatize um, refugees. Um, and of course, you know, as I said before, not all refugees would be shipped to Rwanda. And, and you know, we know that those refugees that will be tend to look like us, black and brown. Um, this will stigmatize the people who are black and brown and of refugee families in the UK who are there legally. Because if it becomes, you know, here in the United States, I'm sure in many countries, uh, whenever there's strife against minorities, I always say, go back to where you came from, get mm. back on the boat, all of those kind of um, racist uh, mm -hmm. tropes. Well, what do you think that this will do to legal immigrants there who people who are not pleased with the immigration system will just want to say, well, why can't we send them away too? Okay, Calvin, still looking at the reason why the UK is making this asylum deal with Rwanda. Now, it says that it's to stop a flood of all too often deadly crossing of the channel from France by refugees and migrants. Now, do you think this will actually serve as a deterrent and what can be done to curb this trend? I don't think it'll be a deterrent just because from what I've seen, obviously, you know, they don't know what numbers um, that uh, the numbers of migrants that would be involved in this program. It's very low. I also, you know, just want to point out that even the the home office government said that they had no real proof that this would be a deterrent as far as decreasing numbers. Mm. Um, I think it's wrong headed that if you are going to set up a system of, you know, disincentive, for migrants to come in if you're trying to stop human trafficking but the punishment so to speak is on the people being trafficked and not the traffickers then i don't think that's going to stop anything um so i think this like i said this plan is all around wrong and even if it didn't have the human rights and legal problems it's not even clear that it would be effective if it would even um change enough numbers of immigrants to really fix the migrant situation in the uk Okay, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. I'm afraid this is where we leave it. I do appreciate uh, your time and insights on the program. Thanks for joining. Thank you. Thank you. You're watching The Conversation and New Central Television. We'll go on a quick break. And when we come back in the second half, we'll be looking at Malawi authority measures. The president, Lazarus Chakwera, has said he's going to cut back on foreign trips to uh, save money for the country. We'll be looking at implications of all of this in detail when we return. Stay with us, it's The Conversation.